Welcome back, guys, to the next episode of Tech on Toast. And this week, we're very fortunate to meet Carl Holloway, co-founder of Rotor Ready. Carl, how are you? Very good. Very good, Chris. How are you? I'm all right. And uh, Carl's got an interesting story about where he is today. Uh, so Carl's recording live from the gym. Is that right, Carl? I am. I was hoping you weren't going to reveal that. I, <laughs> I told my team. To yeah, I told my team I was uh, visiting customers and uh, <laughs> in another office. <laughs> they will have to go back and visit that in the edit then. Uh, anyway, Carl. Um, obviously, uh, we will we'll talk about Roads Ready, but before we get to that, tell me a little bit about you. How have you got to this point uh, of being in charge of this uh, very cool tech company? Oh, thank you. It's a good. It's a. It's a good question. Um, I often wonder that myself, actually, because. <laughs> I'm the first to admit workforce management isn't the, the sexiest thing in the world. So I don't think people sort of dream of uh, starting a tech company and wanting it to be to be workforce management. There's a lot a lot cooler things that you could be doing. But I'm also quite in love with the challenge of trying to make workforce management sexy and trying to make it cool and interesting and engaging. Um, but I started out, uh, my co-founder, Jamie, we went to school together, so we've known each other for years and years. and we both worked part-time jobs when we were at uni and that was our first sort of foray into the hospitality um, and to a lesser extent retail industry and that was just to get us some money to to help us get by while we were poor with poor students and i did computer science changed did physics we both come from a real technical background but we were just pushed into that graduate job scheme sort of rite of passage where you go and get a get a degree and then, and then you do the grad scheme for two years and then you find yourself in an industry and wonder what the hell happened and that was what happened to us because i was in finance i I'd never really had an interest in finance prior to getting a job in finance um although i didn't say that in the interview at the time i said i've, I've always dreamed of working in, in the finance industry my dream job <laughs> exactly yeah and so we did that for for a year or two after we graduated and as you know, the clock just spins around and time flies by. And one day my manager came to me and he put this book on my desk that was I don't know, about five inches thick. And it was called The Swap Curve. And he said, you have to read this and you have to learn it inside out because our next project at work requires you to know this intimately. So I thought, okay, fine. My next assignment, stuck it in my backpack, went home on the train, logged it home. But it was, it was a heavy thing. <laughs> and it sat on my desk for probably a week or two weeks until I got asked whether I'd read it. And I realized I had absolutely zero interest in any of the content that was inside that book. And that was kind of a turning point for me was, was I was thinking, well, I, I want to work on something that, that I'm excited to do. I want to work on something that Monday morning, I'm excited to get out of bed, get in the office and, and get cracking. Um, and finance for me certainly wasn't that. And it was, I think the big thing was I wanted to work on a problem that was really tangible, the problem that I could see people were dealing with on a daily basis. Um, and there are a lot of big problems in finance and it serves a great purpose in, in the economy. Um, so I'm not doing it down. It's just for me, it, it, it wasn't exciting. I, I, I felt like I was quite a few steps removed from the actual problem. Um, and, and so I met up with Jamie and, and, and he was going through a very similar experience in his job. And we both said, well, what was the last big problem that we saw that interests us and uh, that we found interesting? And uh, that was when we were working in hospitality and, and we, we, we reflected on it. And we, we were, I remember where we were, we were in Weatherspoons in Epsom, uh, sharing a pint, moaning about our jobs. That's probably quite a relatable thing. <laughs> and... Uh, there's thousands of people nodding in, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and, and and we said, yeah, do you remember when, when I worked in a pub and, and Jamie worked actually in, in a theme park sort of selling photos when you get off the rides? And, uh, you know, in the, in the sort of £20 key ring and the, and the eight, £8 USB stick and whatever. Yeah, else. I now hate him because my kids cost me a fortune there. <laughs> Bet they do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we realised there were massive parallels between the problems that we saw our managers were trying to schedule large teams of people with complex varying availabilities uh the resulting rotor was haphazard error prone it was printed in size eight font pinned on a wall and you had to trace your name down inevitably everybody turned up on the wrong day at the wrong times continually because they read the rotor wrong 
Um, and in Jamie's particular job, you had to leave your phone in a locker, so you couldn't even take a photo of it with your phone. So it was it was just a, a, a difficult process that wasn't working very well at all. Um, and we thought, that's quite exciting. I'd quite like to solve that. Because I can see the benefits of, of immediately of, of what it would bring if it was done yeah. right. Um, I obviously had that computer science background, so, so my brain was really worrying. And I was thinking, wow, well, what if we could build some kind of algorithm that could do it in the fairest way that didn't give people too many late shifts or too many early shifts and balanced it? Unless, of course, you preferred the late shifts, prefer the early shifts, then, then we could make it do that. Um, and what about balancing rest as well? So people had a similar number of days off. Uh, so Because that was another problem that we saw, is that some people were getting given too much work and other people were getting given too little. And then what if we can allow people to swap shifts because we wanted to do that with our friends who we work with. And invariably that was very hard to do because it was difficult to, to see when they were working and whether it was compatible with the shift we were doing, whether we could swap. Um, and then, then we said, okay, what about booking time off? Because that's also interwoven with the process of building a schedule. And at the moment we have to fill out a paper form and that's, that's sort of a bit of a pain in the ass as well. Then we could see our managers were getting massively bogged down with with mm. this process of, of scheduling and managing the workforce. And, and they spent most of their time doing that. It looked like it made them really miserable and they weren't able to do what they were hired to do. You could tell they were really capable, competent people, but I think it just wore them down. Yeah. And, and, and as time grew on, they were just looking more and more tired. And we thought, yeah, that's that's, a pretty cool problem we could solve because it's everywhere nobody's really solving it particularly well we had we asked around and and actually the first thing we did was we walked around epson when we, we knocked on doors and we walked into every pub restaurant and hotel that was open at half 11 12 a.m on a, on a tuesday we took the day off work to do it um, and we asked people how how do you build your road at the moment how do you manage your staff and most of the time people were like why do you care about that well like that, that that's that you know that's that's the that's the most boring question that anybody's asked me all week but that's when i knew we were onto something yeah because because nobody was was passionate or excited or, or had anything positive to say about it um so it was also a bit of an interesting experience because we were we were trying to pitch our idea at the same time it wasn't necessarily a sales pitch it was more of a fact-finding exercise yeah. But we had an idea of how we wanted to solve it, so we kind of were keen to test the water a little bit with with our, our ideas. And, and we learned a lot because people said, oh, no, actually, I, I do have a system. Um, there's a few I could name. I'm sure you can think of them. And they said, well, I'm, 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 I'm stuck in a contract, so as much as your idea sounds cool, there's nothing I could, I could do right now anyway. Um, or it's decided by head office that's so massively out of our hands. So it was, a, it was a big, big learning experience. And I think it certainly made us uh, realize the scale of the task of what we were about to undertake. And I think, I don't know if we really knew quite how much, how big of an endeavor it would become. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because I, I spent 20 odd years in ops and um, waiters and waitresses and bartenders and chefs sort of stand in two places for more than one minute. And you'd think it was in their section or cooking or serving or taking orders it's not they stand at the tills chatting and they stand at the rotor talking and they're the two I, honestly when i was a general manager i said where are they and i most of the time be six of them gather if you posted a rotor you generally did it on the same day every week if you were consistent right you put it on the wall in the poly pocket on the wall uh mm -hmm. handwritten excel maybe a system that you're talking about another one of the systems that were available when i was in when I was in ops and um, they would stand and literally it was just like no one really talking, just staring, kind of <laughs> understanding what they were looking at and understanding or thinking, how has he put me on a Tuesday again when I've told him I, do, I can't do Tuesdays? How, why am I working a Saturday close and a Sunday open again? Why am I doing, you know, that was, and generally you would field questions or I would field questions for two, three days after the, after the rotor going up or going live. And it's um it it's amazing, and I still think that's happening in a lot of places now. I think it's uh, I think you're right. It's a big problem. Uh, and and I suppose what are the challenges going from that point then on to growing? You know, get, getting the company going. How how do you how did you get to that point? Yeah. So the the big realization for us was that we were focused primarily on rotors, and and, and we we're excited by the, solving that challenge, which we saw as me. 
that, that computer science background is it's a it's a really interesting challenge to solve yeah. well, one that many people have tried to tackle over over decades and um, to varying degrees of success so i was really excited to sink my teeth into that and that was where i was spending most of my time and as, as was jamie really from a, from a strategic sense but as we spoke to more people we learned that okay you could build my rotor for me in three seconds that meets all of my requirements and people's contractual obligations and adhering to the working time regulations and all these other things. That's fantastic. But I have a ton of other problems too as an yeah. operator. And and if and if you want me to be interested in what you have to offer, you have to be solving those other problems as well. Uh, and that was when it dawned on us that, that, okay, we actually have to do HR pretty well too. You kind of can't do the road to peace without yeah. all of the ancillary information that HR feeds into it. You have to be doing the time and attendance piece as well, because there's no good just having a rotor. You can't pay from that. You have to marry that up with the clock ins, the clock outs, the overtime. Uh, so there's that too. And then the biggest one of all is is well, you can't build that rotor unless you know what your demand is going to be like, or at least unless you know you have a, a good feel for what it yeah. might be. Um, so the task massively ballooned, our enthusiasm <laughs> did, and then and then waned a little bit. And you know, it's up and down. As, as, yeah, as, I'm sure. As you know, is the case with any startup. Um, so we realised we had to tackle all of those problems, and and really we we had to do them all really well. If if this product and this idea was going to stand a chance of being successful, so and I was always conscious of spreading ourselves too thin, and. Because that's a trap you can fall into is trying to yeah. do everything, and and I, and I was, Jamie and I were very keen to make sure that we didn't try and get pulled in directions that, that weren't core to our mission. Um, but forecasting demand and, and and a bit of HR and TNA and that kind of thing was all very much central to the mission. That was all something that had to be tackled and achieved. So so we, we were turning our focus on on, on these other areas and, 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 and the biggest one of all turned out to be demand forecasting, which is where we're still focused today and where the, the, the biggest area of innovation for us and it's our biggest expenditure of R and D and cost is on it's on that piece and then getting getting better at that. Um, and and we, we, we jumped into that with the with the sort of same perspective as we had with the rotors was we need to do this well and we need to automate it and it, it needs to be accurate and it needs to work. So that was the that was the second big challenge and one we're still still tackling now. Well obviously you speak to a lot of I mean, you have a lot of customers now and you've uh, obviously you've grown over the years, but what are the what is the most common thing you're seeing? Is it that are people trill because you know I've I've left rotoring myself probably seven, eight years ago. And still to that day, we were still going, can we get productivity right? How do we become more efficient? We don't, and how do we get the balance and zero hour contracts and all that mess was going on at the time. Um, are you still, is it still that challenge for the operators? Are they still trying to find that, that even keel of looking after the employee, but also finding this safe space for productivity that they're actually getting their money's worth? That's exactly it. It's, it's finding that balance. Um, and and the, the big challenge that, that, that we find is, is most operators have the ambition of wanting to have intelligent productivity and demand forecasts, but they often don't have the data. Yeah. Or they do, but it's in systems that don't want to talk to each other, uh, or perhaps they, they, they only have a year's worth and, and that's not quite good enough, especially if it's a, year, a COVID affected year. Um, so so the, the ambition is there, but is the data there or are, are, do, are, are they partnered with the right systems and tools to, to allow them to kind of leverage that and, and, and get a good demand forecast? So I, I find our, our, our most uh, forward thinking customers are the ones that, that, that recognize that and are very, very good at critically assessing the, the yeah. partners and suppliers they work with based on that openness, that interoperability, uh, that desire to want to share the data with with, with other complementary tools and, and so on. So thankfully, we've we've got quite a few what I would call kind of flagship customers now who who have good systems in place. We've built out that ecosystem of integrations and partnerships as well, and we've got good relationships with with lots of the forward thinking uh, suppliers and EPOS and reservations and, and analytics. 
So, so th those are the really, those are the ones that are, that are leading the way. Those are the customers that are, that are sort of trailblazing. Yeah. Because they're, if we say, look, we think we can make your demand forecast even better if we could switch on this integration or if we could get access to this data. And they're the ones that will prioritize that above all else. And, and, and as quickly as they can get that data in our hands. Um, so a good example is, is, is Gusto uh, restaurants, Gusto Italian. Um, I'm sure they won't mind me calling them out by name. Uh, because... Frank's a big fan. So yeah, we know him well. <laughs> <laughs> but, they're, but they're great because they're, they, they have this real critical eye and this, this, this real um, focus on, on, on productivity. And, and, and they recognize what it takes to get that right. And, and, and when they migrated to us, it was because their, their old set of supplies and they, they, they moved a few other systems at the same time. And, and kudos to them because it's a, it's, it's a big undertaking. It really is. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's quite something. And, and they, they, they knew the scale of the task and they knew it was going to be a big challenge, but they, they forged ahead with it. And, Everything was delivered on time. They went live with about eight integrations or so on day one. And they also went live with, with uh, sales and cover forecasts on day one as well. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm pleased to say that our forecasts were beating theirs. And, and that was only possible because they were able to uh, work with us to have those integrations switched on, to have the data there. Uh, and to also furnish it with, with as much information as they possibly could around what sh shifts demand in, in, in their restaurants. Is it, is, it, is it Mother's Day, obviously, Valentine's, events yeah. like that. But, but what, about, what about football and, and, and sporting fixtures? Does that, does that play a role? Or how much does the weather impact? And, and it was a real two-way street because they would tell us what they thought worked. And then we would test that out. With our with our machine learning models, and we would we would run run the models, train them on the data, and and and, and see if their suppositions were were really correct or not. And, and do you know what I love about this? It's the difference in uh, buying tech and using tech, as I call it, because a lot of people bought tech, obviously, particularly over the last three years with the pandemic. But using tech, and people think, well, of course we use it, we bought it. But there's a difference to actually switching it on and just going through the motions to so actually landing it properly and really kind of. Uh, you know, wringing the flannel dry and getting everything you can out of your tech to get to get the return right. Because why would you spend that money unless you get return on investment? I'm guessing with your forecasting, it's going down to local level, right? There's general managers out there in Gusto, for instance, inputting their weather, or you're not inputting their weather, but they've probably got a feed for that, but inputting sporting events, inputting whatever's going on around them. Oh, there's road work's going to happen for the next four weeks outside my site, or I've got scaffolding. And that kind of control. Um, is is crucial i mean I, when i spent i spent months just planning around that kind of stuff to make sure we because you've got to find out what's going to happen it's like walking through the dark otherwise isn't it there's madness so i think that usage of the tech and you've been able to supply good data or them supplying good data to you enables you doesn't it to give them that return on investment absolutely yeah and, and i mentioned it a moment ago having those integrations with their other systems is really key too yeah so having an epos system where we don't just get given sales by time slot we get given item level transaction data yeah. so so we know the exact meals the exact dishes the exact drinks that are served at what times a day uh, and 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 the, the ultimate goal here is is not just to give them super accurate sales forecasts and forecasts of their covers but we're, we're working towards being able to automatically tell them the exact roles they need on shift and at what times yeah I don't know. Some some people claim to do that already, and to to some degree of success. But there's a lot of manual work involved in in doing that, a great expense, and 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 doing it well. And we want to be able to do it in a, in an automated fashion, where we're inferring this kind of thing from the data, um, uh, sort of taking that 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 modern um, modern way of approaching that problem. Yeah, so, and you talked so, about managers. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. I was just saying you talked about managers right at the start, and actually the time that they spend on that, um, on that process, the rotor writing automation, as you just mentioned, there is absolutely key, isn't it? It's this new, I think you called it the modern approach. I, I think entire releasing them onto the floor in in a in a labour short market. Uh, I mean, en enabling them to do their job properly rather than sat in an office banging out. That's it. Like the rotors. And Gusto, yeah, and Gusto are doing exactly that. They're, they're building all their rotors automatically. 
um, using our sort of automatic rotor building feature. And that's saving them an enormous amount of time, which is which is great to see. It's great to see businesses would embrace that because uh, they're the ones that we love working with because they're the ones that push us. They push us to innovate harder and faster. I, I'm, I'll make no bones about it. Gusto are incredibly demanding. But <laughs> I'm delighted that they are because it's customers yeah. like that that push the product and the business forward. And our product looks so different to how it did 12 months ago. I mean, some parts of it obviously look, looks, uh, looks the same, but there's so many more features. There's so many things we've rebuilt. Um, and we're seven years into this now, and we're releasing more updates, more improvements, and more features with every year that goes by. So it, the, the, this pace of innovation is not slowing. And, 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 and so long as I'm here under my watch, it never will, because we're, we're a bit business that's technology and product first. And that yeah. will always be the most important thing for us. We, we, we're, we're still a small team, there's less than 20 of us, but we have one salesperson and 50% of the company is engineering. And the remainder is just success and, and, a, and a bit of marketing and support. And that mix of people is probably the best way I can illustrate where our priorities are. It's really interesting because I was I ran an event yesterday. We did a, an event called Made for Marketing in a, in a church in, in London Bridge yesterday. Um, and a lot of you know suppliers there supporting and whatnot. And uh, when you go to the trade shows, they're flanked by... 10 to 15 t-shirt wearing uh notebook waving salespeople. nothing wrong with that and everyone's got their own approach but that's you're the that's the first time i've heard actually that kind of makeup of tech company in terms of the space you're in have that approach and that that's really so you get a lot of your business through referral by the sounds of it yes yeah yeah we do we do it's a lot of referral either word of mouth uh, from uh, current customers and also quite a lot from our from our, our partner network as well so we have 40 plus integrations now which we've built almost all of them ourselves they're all free we don't charge any of our customers a penny for using any of our integrations switching any of them on we support all of them as well um and again i, I would never want to charge for that because that would only be putting up a barrier to our customers getting more data into the product and, yeah. and making better use of, of, of the platform so so yeah i mean may, maybe <clears throat> i'm sure there's probably people listening thinking you're a fool why have you not got a massive sales team uh and, and maybe one day we will but but so long as uh so long as jamie and i are, are, are sort of excited by the challenge which we very much are we've got years worth of product development already mapped out there's so many exciting things we want to sink our teeth into um, and, and we think that the, the, the makeup and dynamic of the company works best when it's when it's sort of product led. Um, well, that's so, what you said at the start, right? You said right at the start, we're obsessed with uh, we're obsessed with the product and the, the computing, the science part of it is what gets us up in the morning. And you're proving that in the makeup of the team, I suppose, because um, whilst you could put 25 salespeople in and have less engineering, then your product might not be as good as what it is now, right? I, I presume I'm not a tech person. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> no, that's a fair assessment. Yeah. <laughs> and what about the relationship between you and Jamie? Because you're schoolmates, right? You see, so yeah. Together. How how testing is that? Because I have a lot of most people I speak to now on this podcast are co-founders. There's rarely there's a you know one person in charge, but there's you know there's um, mm. two, three, four founders involved. How is that relationship? Because obviously you've known each other for a long time. Is it seamless or is it challenging? Well, of course, it's challenging. Of course, it is, and I know Jamie will say exactly the same thing. <laughs> Um, I, I think I, 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 off, well, I don't often wonder, but occasionally I wonder what it would be like to be running a single founder business. And I've, I've heard that there are quite a few uh, venture capital firms that refuse to back single founder businesses because wow. of the psychological burden that it places on yeah. one person. Um, and some people are very fortunate. They've got a very strong support network around them, but it's, it's, it's kind of hard to validate that. So yeah, it's, it's like running a business. I mean, if, if somebody told me seven years ago that, oh, by the way, you're just about to, about to start your own business and in the next seven years, you're going to have this much turbulence. There's going to be, there's going to be Brexit, there's going to be COVID, <laughs> and then there's going to be a war yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Like, you know, three things that probably haven't, ha haven't happened for, for many uh, yeah. decades or, yeah, generation. Um, and I think, oh, would I, would I have still done it if somebody yes, told me that? Would. Probably, probably <laughs> would have done, actually. Um, but having somebody there going through that with you 
who's not just who's not because you might have your, your partner or, or you know somebody else in your life who's, who's sort of quite close to it but somebody who's as equally as invested as you has as much skin in the game and as much to lose um there's the, it can't be underestimated that the value of, of knowing you've got somebody there by your side who, who, who is in that exact same position and, and having each other through those tough moments. Um, <clears throat> I, I think back to COVID where we felt like the whole business and five or six years worth of effort was, was close to going down the drain um, and, and thinking, what, what the hell are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? And if I was on my own, God knows how I would have coped. Um, so, so yeah, there are just enormous, enormous benefits. And, and the fact that Jamie's a friend and we go back so many years as well is, is, is just wonderful because we, we know we can rely on each other. We, can know, we know we can count on each other to, to, to be there through um, come rain or shine. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased that we did figure out a path through and with the business is, in terms of customers is twice the size of what it was pre-COVID. Right. So actually things have turned out pretty great for us yeah um and and, and, and what a turnaround but yeah we're, we're very different people actually and 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 that's at the start we thought is, is that right given how different we are but actually it's, i think it's turned out to be our biggest strength as the two founders in the business because we're both very uh how do i put it we're we're very, very good at having a conflict and then coming to a, a, an agreement and a resolution. Um, so, so our relationship is is filled with tons of super healthy arguments that always end up in a in a, a great outcome that's that's best for the business because we both are fundamentally aligned on that and always will be. Um, so, so it's fantastic. I wouldn't want to be in business with myself. I'm sure Jamie wouldn't want to be in business with himself. Because we both bring a different perspective to things, and uh, and I think it's that that, that actually allows us to to um, really make it work, and why it's such a great partnership. I, I just think it's really interesting and a lesson for for potentially hospitality as well, where there's a lot of uh, founder led businesses, it, you know, springing up from garages and you know um, houses and sheds from the pandemic, and mm. now getting bricks and mortar and starting to grow, and I, and I, a lot of them seem to be co-founded. A lot of them, are, and it's it's a bit of hand holding, isn't it? And I, I'm I'm in one myself, and it I think it's absolutely, mentally absolutely crucial. And decision making, I think, is so much stronger because you can have the best idea in the world, but you don't know really. You've always got that <laughs> imposter syndrome, that imposter syndrome in the back of your head going. Really? Would you do? And but when you bounce it off someone else, it just validates and it makes it. I think it makes it a lot easier. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. And what about the future then? What happens? So you've you've obviously you've got lots of seven years down the road and lots has happened so far uh, and lots of updates coming. But what what do you think it looks like in another seven years? I mean, that's a long that's a long time. Let's go for two. <laughs> yeah, let's go for two. I think that's a quicker one to answer. Yeah, the next two years, like I alluded to earlier. Our biggest product focus is on on uh, getting demand forecasting to the masses. That's that's the biggest challenge. So how how could we, for example, if a, a, a three site or even a single site restaurant uh, operator came to us and said, "Hey, we've been trading for six months. We want to use your demand forecasting. We have no data. How do we do it? Let's go." Um, and How we, do you we do that? <laughs> it's a good question. We, we're um, which which we spent the last sort of two or three years thinking about and, and, and testing different um, theories and building prototypes and things like that. Thankfully, we're at the size now where we have customers in most parts of the the UK, yeah. pretty pretty spread all over and, and and internationally as well, which is which is fabulous. Um, so. One of the ways we're doing, without revealing too much of our, our secret sauce, is is looking at the um, the qualities and attributes yeah. of an operator's venue, and seeing if we can find similar operators that we already have using Rotary, who who marry up, who have kind of a similar fingerprint, if you will. That might be in terms of the. Their, their price point or their target customer. It might be in terms of the the town or city in which they uh, have have their venue. 
uh, proximity to nearest transport, whether they show sport or are near to sporting stadia. Theatre of um, the road, yeah. Ex exactly. There's, there's almost 100 things that, that, that we throw in to get an accurate gauge on the similarity between two venues that could be very different parts of the country. And if we, if we find ones that are similar, then what we can do is we can take data anon anonymously and use that to help inform the demand forecasting um, algorithms for, for the operator Benchmark that has no data. For sure, this is yeah. yeah, I'm sure yeah. it's more more psychographic than that than that. But uh, you know, um, but that kind of tool. Exactly, exactly. Because then, because then, if you've got no data, we can say, hey, it's fine. Like we've 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 got a good idea already as to what what the picture might look like for you. Um, and 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 the beauty of what we have built is, is it can sort of continue pooling data until such time that it no longer needs to until it's got enough of its own and as, as every day goes by it learns and trains and it's that constant sort of feedback loop that that allows it to to converge on an optimal outcome as time goes by so that's that's something that's that's been a big challenge that we're working on that i'm i'm quite excited by um because having spoken to operators there's so much innovation out there. There are so many people who want to try new concepts, who want to yeah. test the water in new areas or or, or, um, or try out a completely new idea. So if there's a way we can support that and make that less of a risk for them, then, then I think that's fantastic because I think that's that's really what a workforce management partner should be should be thinking about. It's and it's really interesting, isn't it? Because potentially you're aiding site location, right? You're, you're, you're uh, potentially saying, right, we haven't been to Newcastle, we want to go there. Carl, tell us what it might look like. And you may be able to do, you know, when, as you generate more and more customers, you'll be able to give them a picture, which is um, quite powerful. Completely. Yeah. So, so that's one of the big things we're doing in the next few years. Uh, we, we want to carry on just innovating the product in general. The nice thing is, is having a, a modern product and a modern platform is we, we track everything so we can see areas of frustration we can see where people are getting stuck in the system where they're getting lost in the system and we're acutely aware of that high turnover in hospitality and everybody's trying their best to, to to work on that but as long as that remains a problem it's incumbent on, on pr providers like us to make the products as easy to use as possible and and that fundamentally means the user interface has to be super intuitive yeah and the user experience has to be as effortless as possible and that's difficult that's a hard problem to solve when you're dealing with cost control demand forecasts rotors it's hard to make that something that somebody can just pick up and start using without a training course or a manual yeah, but, I, but if, go on sorry i was gonna say if that training course is mandatory or if rather it's required and, and a necessity to use a system effectively then then I think it will it will fail because people will stop using it. They'll go, oh, you know what? Forget it. I'm, I'm going to open up Excel and I'm just yeah. going to start cracking on with that because I know how to use that. I can trust it, and I and I don't and I don't blame I don't blame people for doing that. And and we we're we're forever uh, meeting with people who who are interested in using Rotary, and we ask, oh, well, how do you do it at the moment? They say, well, we're paying for this system. But That's... we're using it, <laughs> but all of our all of our, our, our GMs are using Excel, and they email that to us, and somebody in head office inputs it. And um, um, I mean, the world turns on Excel, but it, but it, but that to me screams bad UI, bad UX. In the yeah, that people, that people trust, right? There's no trust in it, is there? It's like anything in life. Like you know, and when you're, and it's weird. I was doing a podcast with John Mason, who runs Sideways, and we were talking about learning generally. And we we're saying, well, what age does you know when a kid is so inquisitive when they're little, they ask questions, ask questions all the time. What's this? What's that? Why does that happen? And at some point, for some reason, in our in our growing up, we stop asking those questions. And I think you'll find with general managers and all these people as well that they get to a point with with a product. Uh, it might be tech, it might be something else. So they just go, oh, I can't be bothered anymore. I don't want to ask any more questions. I don't want to ask why, because I know it's got to go through four layers. I know it's got to go through a supplier. So they stop using and it becomes, and it's something that's happening to a supplier. They don't even know it. And it takes about a year, I think, in a bigger state to you to find out 
actually, usage has dropped off totally. These guys aren't using it. And this is broken. And we could have fixed it eight months ago. So it's really it's really important that uh, that comms kind of keeps bouncing back up to the people like you that need to know. So as you say, so you can kind of see the barriers in the system. So you can help fix it. But yeah, I think it's an evergreen problem. I think people, mm -hmm. turnover, retention, all that kind of stuff. And we've talked about it in my career since I started. Um, so I, it's a huge challenge to fix. But I think if you can create something in the way they can pull levers to help themselves, that that would be amazing. Any kind of help, I think, will be really well received. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and on the on the point of support and help, we we have live chat built into the, the product. It's a decision we took quite early on, and it was a it was a gamble because we thought, and and I'm not afraid to say this: if you make support too easy, might people lean on it too much? If it's yes. one click away and you're there connected to a human being in in less than 10 seconds is the barrier to entry too low that stops people from perhaps trying things themselves and and and, and testing it out and figuring things out on their own um but actually i'm glad we did it because because people do use it responsibly um but it's it's fantastic because our support team can see exactly what people are doing that they, they can see where they are in the product wow so, so if i'm literally writing a rotor and I've, I've got a problem could i literally text rose ready and say I you can't. click there, there's a there's a bubble in the corner you click it and immediately you're connected to our support team they can see exactly wow. what you're looking at My old GMs, you know, i wouldn't let them near that <laughs> 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 hope they're listening uh, they know what i mean i, I, I think mean. i think it's uh yeah <laughs> i i think it, it, it's one of our most popular features and it's not really even something Brilliant. i would classify as a feature we we have less than five minute response time and we have over 99 percent satisfaction ratings from that live chat tool from, from every I'm, interaction i'm not surprised and and most people coming out the back of COVID have because we've all moved online and we're all doing everything online i think in terms of customer service it's dropped off massively right and a lot of the bigger suppliers brands whatever mm. you want to call it just because they're coping with demand that they've never had to cope with before and they're obviously playing a bit of catch up so i think if you're able to serve people like that because that's what we do right it's hospitality so if you can serve people especially the gm stuck in aberdeen who just needs to know this one thing so they can get on with their day, I think that's, that's probably worth more than actually what you do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I just think that, 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 that kind of, just speaking from experience, that kind of help is huge because that conversation normally has to go through, as I said, three, four, five layers so they get an answer in a, you know in normal circumstances, mm -hmm. which is actually accepted. So uh, so to do that is breaking down barriers. Yeah, good for you guys. I think that's well, brilliant. Yeah, it's a dose of hospitality is hospitality in, in the product. And that's one thing I would implore operators to do when they're evaluating suppliers and systems. And this isn't me coming from a sales perspective because I'm really not a salesperson. I said this to you at the start. It's uh, definitely not. It's You've only got one. one. Yeah, you're I'm not going to make number two. <laughs> 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 no, it wouldn't be me. But I, a real sort of um, piece of feedback I would give is that Operators get very caught up in the tick box exercise of comparing features when looking at suppliers. Um, and that's fine for us because we've got loads of features. So it's not something we're ever, we're ever sort of worried about. But I think one of the most crucial things that, that gets forgotten about when you're uh, so focused on going, oh, well, does it do this? Does it do that? Is well, what about this support? Because invariably you're going to need to use it. What about the human side? That that handholding, the the, the 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 thought through rollout plan and deployment and training and how quickly does the support team respond and are they actually competent? Yeah. And and, and it's very very rare that people say to me, "Can I can I talk to your support team or can I ask a customer what your support team's like?" But having been on this side of the table, if I was ever on the other side of the table, that's probably number one that I'm going to be asking is. Is how quickly does your support team respond? How easy is it to get in touch with them? Um, and and how quickly do they resolve things? Do it, does the first person I speak to and the first person I'm connected with, it, it's are they weird. resolving things or are they just the mailbox? Yeah, and you've got the C-suite plan, which is, you know, these guys are based around finding the correct answer for the bottom line and for the top line. They've got to, you know, they've got to make a sensible decision around can we generate more revenue with this tool? And can we also be more efficient? Which makes sense, right? That's a professional decision. But I think from an operator's point of view and for people on the ground, I actually think that is a huge benefit. Just because, as I said, because these guys work in, in silos. They work on their own. They're often, you know, they have an area meeting once a month, maybe if they're lucky, maybe a bit more. 
um, but that they'll spend time on their own struggling with tech. Um, and uh, anyone who denies it is lying because uh, it's happening every day in every restaurant across the land and bar, whatever. So it's, and I'm not talking massive struggle. I'm talking that little thing just stops you getting through your day or you put something out that's not quite right because you couldn't really find the answer. So it's about, yeah, if you can iron out those um, problems with support, it's absolutely huge. And I think it will come more and more to the front of, uh, I think, questioning because uh, people are going to find themselves butting their heads at the moment against products they've bought, which which can't. And it might not be that they don't work. It might just be the rollout, as you said, that the rollout didn't land properly. So uh, we're finding mm. all these problems everywhere that don't help. But I think it's really cool. It's really interesting. So and I hijacked your future question totally there because I got excited <laughs> about this. <talk. laughs> and, and, and what about you? Are you... Um, we had a brunch, didn't we? We were brunching about four weeks ago together in Manchester, which was fun. We were. Are you uh, are you out and about across the country, or are you uh, are you based? Where are you based? Down in London. Yeah, we're based in in Victoria Station actually. So we we try to get out as much as we we possibly can. But um, but oddly enough, that more and more people are still doing things online. Um, I thought it would kind of drop off, but but it's 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 staying. Um, it's sort of maintaining its current rate. Of uh, online meetings and things, but yeah, we're we're trying our best. We came to Manchester. It was a uh, that was a really fun event. It was yeah, so it was so nice to meet so many people who I've been communicating with digitally for nearly two or three years. Yeah, um, and it's weird. People are sometimes a lot taller or a lot shorter than you <laughs> imagine they were. I don't even want to know what I was, but yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I actually but some people yesterday. on Zoom they look like they're going to be about six foot three. <laughs> and then and then they're not and you're surprised oh, I, know. I don't know why i met isabel from deliver act i talked to her a lot um isabel hane who works in the people team at deliver act and i've been talking to, she was formerly marketing so we had a lot of conversations the past few years and i met her at a trade show two weeks ago and she's really tall and literally i don't know why i was just like wow you're really tall and she went what a weird thing to say you've never met me and that's the first thing that came out of your mouth so yeah i hear where you're coming from uh, and what about a day off do you what do you do do you've got any hobbies or anything you like to do you're in the gym <laughs> right now um, I'm 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 quite into CrossFit actually for my really? for my sins. I yeah, so I always like going to the gym and people people take the Mickey out of out of CrossFitters um, because they say it's like a cult. And and I was very much somebody it who, is. who <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm I'm not gonna lie, it is, it is. Um and I I I what's the word? I sort of rejected it for a long time. I thought, no, I'm not going to join that. It's not me. And and then my girlfriend was nagging and nagging and nagging. And she said, no, I think it's really you. And I think you'd really enjoy it. And I was just being all negative, grumbly, saying, no, I'm not going to go. And then she, I think she might have even signed me up for the trial session on my behalf. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, and I reluctant. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Honestly, the thing she has to start with. But I did it. And I, I, I went down. Uh, and 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 turned up and uh, and I mean I I nearly passed out I I, I I I felt quite faint afterwards and and I the way that if you're on a flight and the plane's landing and sometimes your ears don't pop yeah. and all you can do is hear your own voice reverberating in in your head <laughs> yeah. that happened to me after the workout <laughs> um, where I'm really spelling it here everyone's going oh I must try it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a great That's community, right. isn't it? I've got a lot of friends. Yeah. I'm in Wales, and CrossFit is massive in South Wales. Everybody's doing it, apart from me. Uh, and uh, it's quite a nice community, isn't it? They're quite social, and there's quite a lot going on, isn't it? Uh, from what I see from watching people on social media eating donuts. There, there really is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone's actually amazingly friendly, super enthusiastic about about working out and, and, and learning new it sounds sounds like I'm going into a sales pitch for CrossFit now. But <laughs> yeah, but it's different levels, isn't it? It's not what I've noticed is there's not because everyone in thinks it's gonna be a load of beefcakes, you know, doing hundred sit-ups in a second. It's actually not, is it? It's a real mix of people, isn't it, who want to just kind of massive get mix of yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Like there are people all different shapes and sizes. And and week two they had me doing handstands and <laughs> doing swinging like a monkey off of, off of bars and things and it's just tremendous fun and you feel like you've learned a new skill because yeah. they've taught you how to do olympic weightlifting and doing muscle ups on rings and, and doing a clean and press and a split jerk and a snatch and all of this there's a whole vocabulary there's a whole lexicon of terms that i i simply have never heard of and you turn up to do a workout and there's a screen with the workout written on it and it's it could have been written in Japanese. I, I, I had no idea what an AMRAP or an EMOM and all of these 
Uh, that sounds like something acronym. we buy from sushi, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, look, so, it's, it's... So, yeah, that's that's my thing. That's what I do, and I, I know Jamie's more of a Jamie's more of an outdoors kind of guy. So he he likes his hikes and his marathons and things like that. So there's yeah, another I'm way. Jamie. That we're... I'm with Jamie all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, I live in Wales, mate. We're spoiled by mountains, so yeah, we we have the fortunate. You know, I can literally walk out of here now and just head up a mountain. You're so we're very, very lucky. lucky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, look, really interesting. And if people want to get hold of you, Carl, how can they how can they find you or track you down apart from on support? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, obviously, yeah, live chat on roadready.com. <laughs> um they can uh, drop me an email, Carl at roadready.com, uh, or, or just give us a ring as well and and, and ask to speak to me. But with Jamie and I don't hide away. So yeah, we're always happy to talk to people. Great. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was Carl Holloway, co-founder of Rotor Ready, guys. And if you need to find out any more, you can find them all over uh, their website. It's rotorready.com, I presume. Am I right? That's it. All right. Perfect. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you all next week.